Welcome, everybody, to this talk. My name is Julian Fischer. I'm CEO of Any9s. Uh, we are a cloud, cloud foundry consultancy, um, currently focused on cloud foundry data services uh, located in Germany. So the talk is going to be about uh, building a production-grade Postgres Cloud Foundry service, which leads us to the question, what does production-grade mean? So with the variety of customers we've been working in the past, uh, we've seen various definitions of, of production-grade. So for this talk, we'll actually um, um, go with the de definition we at Any9s have been using in the past because uh, for historical reasons, uh, we run a public uh, Any9s uh, public Cloud Foundry pl platform called Any9s. So back in 2013, we started running Cloud Foundry um, as, a, as a public offering. So when using, uh, when offering Cloud Foundry to a public audience, you actually onboard various kinds of users. So people you don't know, people with you know, poorly designed apps, people with, um, with vicious apps, people, bad people trying to break your platform. So operating a public pass actually turned uh, into a learning environment. Uh, so the production readiness litmus test uh, you can have is offering a, a public platform, basically. So I think it can't get any worse. So in case you, you withstand a public offering, you will also be fine in a more private environment. So actually with these experience we've made, um, we started to investigate how to create data services because there were none. You know, back in 2013, nobody had service brokers. Uh, there were some, you know, shipping with Cloud Foundry, but they've been deprecated then. So we used them and um, they were, well, let's say not really production ready. So we actually started investigating what it, does it actually mean to have, you know, a database being deployed on a public, uh, on, a, on a Cloud Foundry? So uh, we've been through a journey that uh, took us like two years uh, and six people working on, on, a, on a service framework to doing, um, taking care of data services. So this talk will focus on Postgres, um, but basically most of, of, of the things are, can be transferred to other data services as well. So, and as the rest of, of the conversation we have um, will be around leading through the design decisions that are necessary when building a data service. Um, sadly, 25 minutes or 30 minutes um, are not enough to cover this, uh, this topic. I can, you can you know, go, come to our booth and push play. I will talk like two days straight about this topic. So feel free to do so. Um, so one of the most important things when building a Cloud Foundry service is uh, how do you actually implement the Service Broker API? So there are only a few uh, methods to be implemented. Looks uh, simple, but isn't. So one of the most important decisions is actually what is your service instance going to be? And um, for Postgres, uh, there are a number of decisions you, you actually have to make, and one of which is what you actually want to offer as a service instance. Um, so we actually come back to this question as it will uh, require going through some other Postgres decisions, one of which is whether using a Postgres server or a single server or a cluster. So, well, offering a platform, you'll have users, you know, playing around with a small toy app, they won't have a Postgres server that's cheap, like five euros a month. And um, some, some customers with uh, a production create app, maybe they move away from uh, physical servers, uh, they want to go to your platform, they want to have a production create database that's being clustered in order to be stable even when infrastructure incidents happen. So the question on whether to uh, deploy a server or a cluster cannot be answered as a, as a general, uh, this is how to do it right answer, but it heavily depends on the, the context of the customer. 
So let's go into the cluster topic uh, just for a few minutes because once you got the ability to deploy a cluster, you can deploy a single instance anyway. So the clustering Postgres and making Postgres highly available is uh, a little cumbersome because it inherently ha has never been designed uh, to do that. And with a transaction-based SQL database, you know, reminding of the cap theorem, it's not, it's not a simple task to do. So one of the possibilities to actually make a database, um, to make a database um, highly available is to introduce replication. So when thinking of replication, you, the, you may think of whether using synchronous or asynchronous um, replication, where synchronous replication means that uh, transaction has to be confirmed by a majority of the cluster nodes, where asynchronous replication, you write against the master, and those changes will be replicated to a slave, um, accepting that there's a certain difference between the master and the slave called the so-called replication lag. So the far away your, your slaves are, the greater the replication lag, and in case something goes wrong, the greater your data loss is, because there is a data loss. Uh, with the size of the replication lag. So in our case, we've been looking at MySQL and Postgres. We decided to go with Postgres as the first relational database to implement using the service framework. Um, so we had in mind that there's uh, MySQL uh, with Galera, very nice uh, synchronous database uh, management um, uh, cluster based on synchronous as, uh, replication. So we thought, um, looking at Postgres, um, Postgres has built-in replication since Postgres 9, uh, and it's asynchronous replication. We thought, why, well, fair enough, having one RDBMS with synchronous replication and one with asynchronous replication, we stick with asynchronous for Postgres. So that decision being done, we figured out that, um, well, too hard, uh, that the replication facilities within Postgres are fairly limited. And there's a variety of tools you can use and to, to, to actually overcome that problem. And it's not really easy to find out which one to use, but um, we'd actually try to build a Postgres and make this available to our customers, which is you know, uh, you know, easy to automate um, because we, we actually um, have to take care of um, the cluster management. So we, we just looked at the replication built into Postgres and seen that there is actually no cluster management. There's replication, but no cluster management. So what does cluster management mean is um, you have, let's say, three databases, a master and two slaves. What happens if your master uh, database server goes away? So you need something that actually recognizes that um, your, your master is gone. That seems easy, but um, it is not because uh, Sometimes your network might have um, trouble. So in case of a network partitioning, you, it could be the case that the communication between the servers are disturbed, but the master's actually there. So you have to find a way to ensure that um, you're not performing a failover, although still you have a master. So that, those are the tasks usually solved by cluster managers. Uh, not worth talking about that too much here. So there, there are solutions to that. But we need a component taking care of this. So a small summary of, of the cluster thing is that you want to have three nodes instead of two so that you have always a majority of servers so you can clearly judge whether there's, uh, uh, well, that a majority can decide upon whether there's uh, a new master and who's it going to be. So after looking at several solutions um, his, from historical reasons, we've been um, operating Cloud Foundry, uh, sorry, um, databases, Postgres databases for seven years now. We've been starting with um, physical databases um, being clustered in such a cluster with master and slave. We've been using Pacemaker to, to um, do the cluster management. Uh, so the first approach was, uh, can we do the automation? Can we take the automation we have around Pacemaker and, and put it into a Cloud Foundry environment? And clearly the answer to this is, no, you can't. Well. You can, but it's not really meaningful because Pacemaker is a beast. It uh, depends on every single Linux library ever written. So in order to Boshify that, you will actually have to Boshify the universe. So that's a bad idea. 
Also, it's, um, it's not really nice to automate it. It's the way pacemaker has been done is, it's not really something you wanna put into a Bosch release. So what we found is that Rep Manager is a good solution. So it's simple, it, it does the job, um, and it, you know, it actually basi basically does the job fairly, fairly good. So it does um, also monitor your application performance, but most importantly, it does failure detection and uh, helps performing automated failovers. There's a little research to that, and uh, there are a lot of, let's say, um, edge cases uh, when it comes to Cloud Foundry, uh, because you can't just you know, take away one server and promote another server in, um, in a Cloud Foundry environment, because there might be IP address changes. So how do you actually tell your application that uh, the application should now write to a different database server? So that's one of the problems to be solved. In our case, uh, we added a console cluster to our service framework. So to be a little ahead of the talk, we, we use Bosch underneath to deploy uh, database clusters. So whenever there's a change in the cluster, we'll tell our console and we use a DNS alias uh, to, um, in the credentials so that your application will always have a DNS entry resolving to the right master. And the cluster manager, the rep manager, in this case has one of the, uh, one of the purposes is that when it promotes a new master, we will talk to the console and update the alias pointing to the master. So the trigger actually comes from the rep manager, but the execution of the actual failover is done using console. All right. Once we actually um, made a, a decision that we want to support a clustered Postgres, we also have to uh, make the decision uh, what the service instance is going to be. Is it going to be a single cluster that will be sliced up, or is it going to be a cluster per, per service instance? So actually two different strategies come to mind, a shared or a dedicated approach. With a shared approach, what you do is basically you create a single Postgres server or a single Postgres cluster, and you slice it up into different databases, and each database is going to represent a service instance. So this is very easy, because you need to, do, you need to create a Bosch release, you need to deploy one Bosch deployment, uh, creating your Postgres cluster, and your service broker will then access this cluster and return appropriate credentials. The drawback of this solution, however, is that um, the isolation between the service instances are pretty weak because Postgres has isolation built in, you know, multi-tenancy capabilities, but they are fairly restricted. So when accessing uh, a database a server, one app can drag down the performance of the entire cluster, hitting the cache or you know, creating uh, disk utilization and CPU utilization. So the contract towards the customer will be fairly fuzzy because you never know what you, how much of a database you actually get. Another major problem with that approach that even with a cluster, your cluster represents a single point of failure within your entire architecture. So um, a production Cloud Foundry system, um, you have a runtime, and the runtime is, you know, it's, it's just an awesome piece of technology. Cloud Foundry is awesome, right? So you'll deploy a tremendous amount of apps against, against um, the runtime. And now you have a load of apps and one database cluster. I mean, you know, that doesn't sound right, doesn't appeal right, for the obvious reason that whenever your database cluster goes down, and I can tell you, you have a component in your system, it's going to fail. Whatever it is, it's going to break, right? So we recently melted down our OpenStack because of a, a kernel uh, driver issue, and because all the hosts were the same, we had the same problem all the hosts, so 20 out of 24 holes died within one hour, right? So fuck availability zones. Sorry, didn't say that. <laughs> it was just all gone, all right? So well, let's say we, want, we really want to ensure that um, whenever a cluster goes down for some reason, the situation won't look like this because a lot of applications will rely on your Postgres. And uh, I can tell you how this feels. 
Exactly like that, because your phone will keep on ringing and customers will give you a bad time because they are so disappointed because they said, new, they expected the platform to work. So the problem with the shared cluster in general, and that's true for every data service, is that once this cluster goes down, you, all your instances are gone and you'll have a lot of trouble. So what's the counter strategy to that? Obviously, it's going to be dedicated clusters for everybody. So instead of having a single database cluster or a single uh, database instance, you'll have multiple of them, maybe even both. So in the ideal world, and we've made that happen, you can actually create a single instance or uh, a large single instance or a single cluster or a large cluster. And you can also migrate between them. And um, with that, you'll have a big advantage also when creating a contract towards your customer. Because now, when you create a dedicated cluster, you use infrastructure resources for and the infrastructure isolation to create this multi-tenancy uh, behavior. Which means that when I provision a Postgres with four gigs of RAM, you're going to get four gigs of RAM, CPU, and a certain amount of disk. And in case your application needs more resources, will just scale to a larger database. But it's never going to be your neighbor tracking down your cluster because his app actually goes crazy unless you have a, uh, let's say, unfair amount of overcommitment in your infrastructure, which is totally up to you to decide, but the solution is actually safe. Um, so looking at the same scenario, you now have a different ratio between applications and service instances. So if one of these service instances go down, the problem is pretty much contained, and you have only one angry call to answer, right? Saying, well, excuse me, it's, things went wrong, and we're going to fix it. So your problems are going, your problem with uh, Postgres failures are going to be contained. Right, so we've been through the question of having a single server or a cluster. We've been through the question of, being, uh, of having a shared or a dedica or dedicated approach. So ideally, you have a choice between single or cluster, and it's going to be dedicated. Well, the drawback, obviously, is that it uses more infrastructure resources, but then you have a stable contract to the customer. It leads to the question, when do I actually provision those virtual machines? So two strategies, again, come to mind. We could actually pre-provision those virtual machines, so that can be immediately handed over, we'll do this later. So with the pre-provision strategy, you have a service broker and a pool of service instances, like you know, several of each plan you offer, and whenever somebody uh, performs a create service command, you'll just assign one of, the virtual, uh, one of the service instances out of your virtual machine pool. Same for a cluster, just that you, you know, assign a cluster instead. The problem with that approach is obvious, like, You'll have 10 of those things on hand, and there's a hackathon going on, and people start creating service instances like Razy. You run out of pre-provisioned instances. So also, these pre-provisioned instances will consume infrastructure resources even if nobody uses the database. So it's actually, again, a counter strategy that comes to mind, which is, why don't we provision this, these service instances um, once you know somebody creates service. So in order to do that, you have to provide some automation, and um, whenever you do CF create, this will actually create then a, uh, a Postgres uh, server or a Postgres cluster. So pre-provisioning, the benefit is you will have your service instance right away, and the on-demand well, you have the advantage that you don't use the resources, and once you go down that, that path, you'll be able to serve as many instances as your infrastructure actually has resources. So we actually started with the pre-provision approach because then we could actually fill uh, the pool being deployed manually, you know, already giving the customer the appearance of having, you know, dedicated instances, and then we actually did the automation afterwards, filling up the pool um, once the automation is ready, automatically. 
And then, of course, we can actually switch down the pool size because you actually have to provide you know, instances from each service plan. So we can turn our framework into um, deploying those things entirely on demand. A mixture is interesting in cases where you have CI pipeline creating certain, certain service instances um, at a high pace, so where the provision time does matter to you. So it's a kind of a drawback and a balance you have to make. You have to make those design decisions, and you can configure it. So we'd like to have a, a pool, small server for, for testing purposes on hand, and the rest is going to be provisioned uh, on demand. So with that being said, um, you can't on-demand provision uh, something without automation. So one of the key questions is how do you actually do this automation? And um, while containers are very modern and fancy, and maybe it's going to be the future, um, we had the impression that uh, having a database, a database should be close to the metal, as close as it's as it is possible, because often you know performance is is an issue, and also we would like to have an automation technology we can really really rely on. And after operating Cloud Foundry with Bosch for years, we really fell in love with Bosch. And that's not very obvious because our team was using Chef for six or seven years, so uh, for them Bosch was really a challenge to what they already have been using but uh, they learned to fall in love with Bosch. One of the reasons is because Bosch gives you infrastructure independence, and we moved infrastructure twice. We actually started on VMware, moved to OpenStack for cost reasons, and recently moved to Amazon for stability reasons, but that's just because we, we can't run OpenStack. We are a platform company, not an infrastructure company. Also, I've, I've not seen many solutions that really inherently uh, do, do the orchestration of entire distributed systems so well as Bosch does, including virtual machine and persistent disk image, while being entirely uh, uncoupled from operating system. So back in the chef days, you have a cookbook with uh, if-else clauses for different operating system. Also, using different package managers gives you a very heterogeneous system in the end. So it, this whole operating system support will, will actually go through the, um, the cookbook, and it's not very nice. So with Bosch, you have a clear contract here. Also, the separation of, of a blueprint of um, a distributed system. Let's say, um, yeah, the blueprint in, in a Bosch release, and in, in contradiction to that, the, the specific construction is a very interesting approach in Bosch. So when it comes to deploying data services, the advantage you get is, looking at the Postgres cluster example, is we have a, a Bosch release that, that deploys a Postgres cluster, but the same Bosch release with a different manifest can just deploy a single machine. So you, you actually cover a variety of, of data service plans with just a single uh, automation. Also interesting uh, using Bosch is once you use Bosch to deploy your Postgres cluster, you get the monitoring and self-healing capabilities of Bosch for free. So um, as I said, the rep manager will take care of your data of your instance. So whenever a database server goes down, um, the rep manager will talk to console and your application will continue to write to, one, to the new database master. But Bosch will recognize that there's a missing virtual machine and will just resurrect the virtual machine. And the virtual machine comes up, it will actually recognize uh, that it's not a, a master anymore. It's a new virtual machine, right? So it will recognize that, it's, uh, that now it's a slave and, be, and integrate into the cluster as a new slave. So we ha actually have with Bosch an integrated way of recovering from a degraded mode after an incident. And that's a very nice thing to do. That is also topped by the scalability scenario where we also want to be able to take a single uh, service instance. Let's say I've created a small app and deployed it on the platform, but now my app needs to grow. So what I can do is uh, see if create update and turn this into a large cluster. So how is that possible? It's possible because um, the service um, framework actually creates a new de uh, Bosch deployment. 
and you hand over Bosch, the Bosch deployment, and Bosch will actually create new virtual machines and you know, scale the one that's existing and copy over the data. So you, you get that behavior fairly uh, at, at low cost. It's not for free, you have to do some management around it, but it's, it's, it's so much that's already been done by Bosch that um, it's fantastic. So of course, the same strategy applies when you want to uh, create, a, when you scale a small cluster, like this fellow on the right side, to a large cluster. It's just taking down the virtual machines one after the other, so your service keeps on running, scaling the virtual machines, so you scale your cluster. All right, so now with that all being said, well, this fancy thing is like, how does it actually look like in, in the resulting system? Um, the architectural overview is looking like that. So we found out that um, the service broker basically does nothing really data service specific. So we outsourced everything that's specific to a data service into a small separate microservice called the, the Postgres SPI, Service Provider Interface, comparable to the Cloud Provider Interface of Bosch. So what this fellow does is offer the metadata, so telling which service plans are offered, and also when creating a service binding, it issues the credentials. For the initial credentials, this includes the initial credentials. So credential management and everything uh, service specific is going to be in the SPI. So the service broker then triggers um, the creation of uh, Bosch deployment, uh, which will then talk to Bosch. And subsequently, of course, there will be virtual machines being deployed by Bosch. So the service broker, as I said, it implements the Cloud Foundry service broker API. It's generic for all the services we have. We have Rabbit, Redis, RabbitMQ, MongoDB, and Postgres. Um, and um, it can be configured to use the SPI as a remote service. The SPI itself, as I said, encapsulates those data service specific uh, logic and uh, among that, the service catalog um, the, and the credential management. So the deployer is a small abstraction um, abstracting from Bosch deployment. So it actually does two things. First, it manages deployments, of course. And the second is it manages templates, which is, can be you know, seen as um, a Bosch manifest with placeholders in it. So, how does it actually look and how, those, how do these components interact is whenever you, can you see that? Yeah. So whenever you call a create service, you'll actually hit the service broker who will then talk to the SPI because what the service broker has to do in the next step is to, to trigger deployment using the deployer. In order to do that, it has to hand over the name of the template to, uh, to deploy as well as some deployment attributes. So um, one of the information uh, that is required to do that is the, the service plan the customer has chosen, which maps then to a deployment template. So the system, what the system actually does, it creates a service broker that lets you um, trigger Bosch deployments. So actually you could also deploy Cloud Foundries with that solution if you create a Bosch release for Cloud Foundries. Um, so yeah, after you got those uh, information, you can uh, then uh, pick a deployment against the deployer by handing over the template and the attributes, who will then generate a deployment manifest and trigger the deployment. The cloud controller then keeps on polling whether the deployment is already done, and once it's done, the, um, um, the service broker will store some metadata about the deployment, because if you want to create then later uh, a service binding, you'll have to know that there is a data, you know, a dedicated instance running somewhere. So the SPI is able to co connect to this database uh, server and, you know, create a new database user. So you have to store some metadata, uh, which is, again, not service specific um, because it's handled by the SPI in the end. So this works like Charm. We've been using X solution for roughly developing it for two years and using it more than a year in, on our platform. Um, and um, yeah, it's proven and it works. So what can we actually learn from that is, first of all, designing a data service, go with the dedicated service instances. 
anything based on a shared cluster is dangerous. Um, might be working if your company is small, but at scale, uh, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be using it. So every, every shared data service we've been offering, it exploded at some to at time. So with that, on-demand provisioning is uh, essential. So you have to pick an automation tool uh, you are familiar with, and you'll you know, have to find something, preferably that really takes care of the life cycle of a, of a distributed system, such as a database. So because you, you will have to solve the problems of how to update that in the end as well. So the biggest challenge was not about the framework, was not about Bosch, was not about everything. It actually was about Postgres. So finding a Postgres replication and clustering tool set was the things we actually had to investigate and how to make this failover happen on, on infrastructure, but still not being infrastructure specific. So we can take the service framework and we've deployed it on VMware, we've deployed it on OpenStack, we've deployed it on Amazon, and we didn't have to, have, have to change a thing. Um, despite of cloud configuration of the, uh, of the Bosch releases, obviously. So let's consider configuration, not change of code. So we also had to learn a lot of Postgres uh, and iteratively you know, shape the thing. Edge cases have been found, so you have to do some automation around that. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Um, it works, the, the strategy works, so um, and we're also open to conversations on how to, and sh to share that with you. So just approach me and, and ask if you're interested in something like that. We'll, we, we help you building data service if you want to. So feel free to ask any question about this. Questions? So overall, the, the, the handsome fellow in the blue shirt, yes? You. <laughs> All right. Whoa. <laughs> Are you all awake now? All right, so basically, overall, very good uh, thought fodder there, good approach. Thank you, Wayne. I have to respectfully disagree a bit about the uh, dedicated versus shared. There are times when you want to go shared, especially if you're, like, you're a service provider and you've got just massive amounts. So the key there is actually investigating whether you can actually have, I've had coffee, sorry, if you, whether you can actually have a uh, plan to start somebody on shared, like the free tier, and then migrate them very easily to a dedicated. So that, that's something you that should That could be a way to go to, yeah. Bosch, well, with, as far as Postgres is concerned, oftentimes you can actually get a much better uh, performance scenario if you have uh, separate disks. So Bosch currently has, a, I'm saying this for the community as a whole, Bosch has a really nasty limitation of a one disk policy. I'm hoping it's in the roadmap to fix that. I'd like everybody to apply pressure for that because that can really help the services stories uh, when deploying with Bosch. Uh, and we uh, just announced at the Postgres Conf in New York City that uh, open sourcing of a similar project called RDPG. It's, uh, we did it for GE. They allowed us to open source it. A lot of the same concepts and approaches were done within it. So uh, now that that's open source, what I'm, I would literally like to see is, uh, if, uh, you know, is this open source and can we merge efforts instead of having two efforts? And like, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts on open sourcing that is that we are actually currently investigating open sourcing it. So this solution has also been uh, this developed over time. We've been using it at the platform. So it could be open source soon, but this is a discussion that's currently ongoing. So I can't answer that to a final degree yet. But we're currently talking about uh, with partners on how actually open sourcing uh, could look like. Because we have a, a development team to fund here. And if there's no license money coming in, we have to replace that. So um, that is very fair. So everybody hire them so that they can open source. Yeah, the, yeah one, of, one of the models we <laughs> actually could apply is that uh, we'll have sponsorships so that uh, people can influence the backlog of such a solution, maybe telling us which data service to make next. So we open to suge su uh, suggestions here. Sounds good. Thanks. Welcome. Any other questions? No. Well then, yeah. Uh, There's a plugin system in the framework that allows you to um, uh, create streamed backups. So you can actually read, uh, well, let's say, write a headlocks and, and then stream it in chunks to, let's say, OpenStack Swift or Amazon S3. 
We currently have only basic uh, strategies implemented, like uh, like creating a dump instead of uh, write ahead log logging. I think Stark and Wayne has something interesting. It could be integrated as well. So yes, there is something uh, foreseen in the framework, but implementation, the plugins actually need to mature a little more. It's it's that's the thing currently under development. Yes, that's for the next one. All right. Sorry. Thanks. So I'll be around. <laughs>